I want you to imagine that all the 50 or so trillion cells that make you up are now just one single cell. What would happen if we did the same with all the bacterial cells in our body? You'd be surrounded by at least 100 bacterial cells and possibly hundreds of thousands of different viral particles as well. Now you might wonder how they all fit inside us. How does this discrepancy of having a hundred times more bacteria and possibly many more bacteria actually physically fit inside human cells. The trick is they're much smaller than us. One of my favorite analogies to explain this to people is the idea that the Statue of Liberty is the size of one of our cells, one of the eukaryotic cells, and a bacterial cell, your typical bacterial cell, would be the size of a human being compared to the Statue of Liberty. That's the size difference we're talking about here. Our eukaryotic cells are much, much bigger due to being able to process energy and other cool tricks which we've talked about previously on the show. There's also this other layer of complexity I hinted at the beginning, that viruses don't just infect us, don't just infect eukaryotic cells, bacteria also have their viruses called bacteriophage and these are probably the most abundant thing on the planet that sort of is or isn't life, again, what is life we've talked about before, but the level of bacteria that exist on this planet is in the trillions and trillions and trillions while the viruses that feed off these bacteria are at least an order of magnitude bigger. To an outside observer or a dispassionate microbiologist we are bags of bacteria and viruses and the question becomes what are we doing with these huge amounts of bacteria? Why do we have them? Why do we allow them to stay? We have immune systems. What are they doing for us? Are they helping us? Are they hurting us? The best response I can give you to this question is we don't really know, but we do know they're important. We do know they have some function and we do know they help us to survive. So let's talk about these types of bacteria. They tend to be called the microbiota or the microflora. This is your natural infection of bacteria that your entire body has. I mean, we have bacteria all over our skins, in our stomachs, in, you know, in our intestines. We tend and shouldn't have bacteria in our bloodstreams. There are places that are meant to be sterile in our bodies. But the vast majority of our skin, intestines, are loaded with bacteria. Something like two kgs of bacteria in the average human adult. There's a confession that I and others I think have to make when we talk about bacteria. We tend to talk about them as the great adversary, as if they're all evil and all terrible, horrible things that will kill everyone at a moment's chance. Most bacteria don't harm us. Most bacteria aren't interested in us. They might be interested in other things and harming other things, but bacteria and pathogens are not the same thing. Pathogens are a subset of bacteria, and even cases where you have opportunistic pathogens which typically don't cause problems but some event arises or some condition changes which means they can exploit their host. But this view of microbial life has limited us to the, the true majestic nature that is the microbial world. Trying to understand the complexities of a, a jungle ecosystem and then comparing that complexity to that found inside the microflora and the microbiota is astounding. The microbiota and the number of species and keystone species and all these interactions happening is orders of magnitude more. And even in the jungle environment, you also have this microbial world working below and under the scenes to, to, to turn over nitrogen, to make nutrients, to, to destroy, to create. It's, it's a level of complexity that humans possibly can't understand. So when I've been making these videos, I've been very conscious to try and distinguish between saying pathogen and bacteria, and not to have these be the exact same thing. And when you hear the words bacteria, please don't automatically assume pathogen. So what does the microbiota do for us? Well, in order to be healthy, we have this tiny army of bacteria and possibly even viruses that keep invader pathogenic bacteria and pathogenic fungi out of us and keep us healthy and safe. They also help us with things like nutrient acquisition and even training the immune system to recognize what a pathogen looks like. This has obviously led a number of researchers to link the idea that the microbiota is involved in good health. But some have gone a step further and they've asked questions that on the face of it might seem a little strange. Questions like, is the microbiota linked to other non-bacterial pathogenic diseases? Things like schizophrenia, Alzheimer's, uh, weight gain, obesity, risky lifestyles. Are these things somehow partly controlled by the microbiota? Tentative connections between these diseases and the microflora and the microbiota have been made. These sorts of connections have been studied and some evidence has suggested that there are links that need to be examined between the microbiota and these diseases. However, 
I'm not aware of any study that shows more than a correlation between the microbiota and these diseases. And that's not to say we won't find one, only that, to my understanding, not one has been shown to fully exist yet. The mechanism of how most diseases work and the pathogenesis of those diseases is still very much a topic worthy of research and discussion. Microbiology is still very much a science where answering one question asks two more. Some have suggested the difference between healthy people and diseased people in the diversity of the microbiota is not the cause, but an outcome of the disease. For example, uh, an alcoholic lifestyle might change the microbiota. That doesn't mean the microbiota difference cause that person to be an alcoholic. Even if that's the case, there's still a need to understand how the change in this person's microbiota is affecting their lifestyle and may be contributing to the disease. Diversity is also a massively complicated and underappreciated field of microbiology. Not just diversity of different species, but diversity within species as well. I think I should end on a topic that's been gaining a little traction recently. This is the idea of microbial dark matter. There is a good TED talk, which I'll put down in the link below, which sort of talks about this idea. Depending on who's reporting it, this dark matter is either a completely novel kind of life that we have no idea, or potentially just small bacteria and viruses that we don't quite recognize. The problem with this dark matter has come out of the two ways we tend to study microorganisms. We can either try and grow them on, for example, petridish or in a culture. This works for a lot of bacteria, but a problem arises when you try and grow a bacteria that requires a really complex ecosystem to survive in. If you just tried to grow a liver on a plate, you, would, you could probably grow a few cells, but you wouldn't grow an entire liver. Bacteria also live in these complex ecosystems and need a whole food web and a food chain of different things and nutrients and different substrates coming in to allow them to exist. And as it stands, we, we, we don't know where or how to grow these things properly because we don't know where they are, what they look like, or even how they exist at the moment. The other way we study them is by extracting the DNA. You can do this for almost anything, and if you just take all the DNA out of the gut and run it through a computer program, and these computer programs have got very, very complex and fantastic at taking short changes of DNA and working out like a 100 billion piece jigsaw puzzle where they all fit in together. We've gotten very good at doing this recently, or I should say computer programmers have got very good at getting computers to do this recently. So some think that this dark matter is currently a, a novel undiscovered life form. I would find that incredibly interesting if it was true, but if I was a betting man, I'd put it on a type of virus or bacteria that we don't fully yet know about. I hope in a few years time with the level of research we're seeing into microbiota, we'll have a better understanding of its role in disease prevention and even other things like the microbial ecology of these complex diverse networks that must be going on inside all living things. Until then we just have to wait and see what develops from this field. A little update to finish with. So I finished my PhD in October and I moved away from the UK. So I'm now currently living in France, which you can tell by this incredibly French fireplace. <laughs> so I'm working on my, my first postdoc. Uh, I'm working on a field which is a little new to me, but I, something I've wanted to work on since I was like six years old, essentially. And this is the field of bacterial phage infection and using it for treatment, so bacterial phage therapy. Um, shush, Doug. Shush. So I, I'm incredibly busy working on that. It's something I want to do my entire life, so I'm spending most of my time doing that. If, you, if you've missed these videos, um, and you've somehow also missed the fact that I do a podcast with the great, fantastic Miles Powell almost weekly, uh, there's a link here, you can click on it and go watch while well, listen. It's a podcast. There's a few video episodes where you can see my charming face. And yeah, we upload weekly, and we talk about all sorts of stuff. So if you if you missed my dulcet tones, go check that out. But until next time, I hope you enjoyed this, and I'll see you then. Thanks for watching.